Hello everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to Computer Science 4300. Today, we are talking about course project information. So very exciting stuff. The course project, what this course is quite literally all about. Um, so if you are out there and you uh, are registered in the course, you can follow along. I've put the PDF up here. And I've seen that a couple of people have uh, followed the instructions already without having seen the um, the lecture. So hopefully you did the instructions correctly because I haven't actually given them yet. But uh, we can just pop open that PDF and I've got it right here. So that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to be reading that um, during this lecture. First I'm going to get this link open and yeah, I think that's all the preamble I need to know. Hello to the people typing out in the chat and if you have any questions at any point during this lecture please feel free to um, ask a question in the chat and I will be more than happy to answer as always. But I'm sure there are going to be questions about the project itself. So let's get started and we will read the course project information. And if I find any typos or anything while I'm doing this I can fix it in real time um, and re-upload the information. So, uh, Computer Science 4303, final project specification for fall 2022. The final course project is to complete a full game, for some definition of full game, using the specification in this document. The game must have the bare minimum functionality mentioned here, and any extra functionality will be greatly appreciated. And so there will be up to 10% of bonus that you can get on the final project, up to a cap of 100% based on um, extra things that you've done. Projects will be done in groups of up to four people. Groups of exactly four people are greatly preferred, but up to four people. And it must be significantly different from the assignments, okay? So you cannot just hand in assignment three. You can't just hand in assignment four. It has to be a significantly different idea from those things. And um, I put out a poll recently, a survey with the class, and I asked for your opinion. And one of the questions was, now that you've done a few assignments, what are you thinking is your ideal group size for a final project? And I like up to four people because the project is a significant amount of work. It really is. And your lives going forward are going to be working with people, okay? and working in groups of way larger than four people. So I still really like the up to four people because people who are super keeners and who can do real, who can work really, really fast, they can still have their group of two, that's fine. But there is no reduced scope for the project if you do not work with four people, okay? So for example, if you and your buddy have another a uh, group of two who you know in the class, by all means, form up and do the project together. Before I get started, you can use any code from any assignment you have written in your project, okay? So if you want to, you can take assignment three or assignment four and start working from that code base, all right? And anything you do for assignment three or assignment four can and actually should be used in the final project. So once I get into the specification for the final project, you'll see that a bunch of the stuff that you have to do for the project is already done in your assignments, okay? You just have to have those features in the project as well. So that being said, let's go over this document. And the document is almost three pages long and it's gonna take me a while to read it and explain everything. But the reason it's very long is because every Every character of information that I do not give you will be 80 emails that I have to answer or 80 Discord PMs that I have to answer, okay? So the reason I often ask people to, um, to post questions in the channel on Discord rather than PM me is because it's a lot easier for everyone to see the response than it is for me to answer or respond to 20 or 30 DMs. So after I... Uh, give out this document, I will have a um, a new channel in the Discord server which is called Project Help and any questions about the project post there. 
unless it has like very specific or um, identifying information about a specific person. Like for example, if you say, hey, we're supposed to work with this, with this group of people, but this person, we haven't seen them in three weeks. Obviously you DM me about that, but any questions about the project itself or the scope or technologies you would ask in the project help. All right, that being said, let's take a look at the overview of the project. So the project is to make a game and I have all of the stuff that you have to have in your game. I'll explain that later, but the project comes in multiple stages and the multiple stages of the project are for your benefit. Okay, they are for your benefit. So the final project is going to be due on the second last day of exams. That gives me like three days to mark what might be 30 projects, okay? I cannot possibly make the final, final deliverable any later than this for any reason. So it's, it's due on the second last day of exams, which is a long time away, okay? So the very first part of the project is the project proposal. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read this information and then I'll go into details about every individual part. So the project proposal is due November 15th, okay? And that gives you um, plenty of time to form your group and to think about your project. Now, I would actually get this done before this if I were you. And you can DM me on Discord and say, hey, our proposal is up right now because we wanna start working on stuff. Can you please review it? So I'm gonna review the proposal to see if it's enough work. And then once I've reviewed the proposal and given you the, you know, the marks for that, then you can get started on your project. The first thing that's due for the project is that three weeks after the project proposal is due, I want to see a video demo of what you have done so far. So the very, very final submission is due one month after the proposal. You'll have a whole month to work on this. Okay. But, one week before the final final thing is due, I want to see a video demo of what you have done so far. Because if I don't, you will wait until December 13th to start the project. I get it. I have been busy in courses before. I did a lot of university courses. I know how busy it can get, right? Especially around exams, etc. So even though the final project is due here, I'm going to want a video of what you have working so far, which is worth 10% at this point. And I'll talk more details about that a bit later. Then the final, final submission is due uh, on December 15th at 11.59 PM. With that, I want the final project code. So the actual code, so I can compile and run it to make sure, okay, this actually works. And within the final code, I am going to be giving the majority of the marks for the gameplay features of the project itself. You need a final presentation video, which is going to be your group is going to record it. Your group is going to upload it to YouTube and send me the link. And you're going to have a YouTube trailer for your game as well, which is like a two to three minute video with funny music or something like, like that, that shows off all the functionality of your game. And we'll get into that in a little bit as well. A really important thing is, and I used this for the first time last winter for my other course, 4303, and it worked out extremely well. And so that is a GitHub template. So we're gonna have a GitHub template for this project. So for this project, you will use the following GitHub template repo. Directions on how to use this template repo we'll discuss in the project lecture which is right now. So if I, I've already clicked on that link. Let's go have a look at what that link entails. So let me zoom in here. Here is the project template repo. So you have my GitHub um, and in that GitHub, you have this repo, which is comp 4300 2022 project. And this is what's called a template repo. And before last year, I didn't even know if this, exist, this existed and it might be a new feature I'm not sure, um, but uh, essentially how it works is it makes setting up your project repo as easy as possible, okay? So here's how you do it. You look at this repo 
Uh, actually, let's just look at what it is first. And there's, um, there's some instructions down here. But basically, all you do is you go to this repo, you click use this template, you have, you give it a repository name, which is your repo name. And I want that to be 4300 underscore your group name or your, your, your game name. And then you click private and then you click create. And then what happens is all of this gets copied into your new repo. You have to make sure that um, it's private though, okay? It has to be private. We will be grading that when you submit the proposal. If it's not private, we'll tell you to make it private. You see here, it includes the due dates for you. And so let's go have a look at the instructions um, in the readme for this repo. So here's the instructions. Click the use this template green button in the top right of the repo. So that's what you'll do. You'll click here. Create a new private repository. You are going to add these users and I'll have another user as well because we have a second TA for the course, but I'm not sure of their uh, GitHub username yet. I'll, I'll edit this when I get it. Um, and you'll add us as collaborators to your project. That way we can see your project code. Then you are going to submit the URL um, to your repo via the project GitHub repo link D2L assignment Dropbox. Okay, so on D2L, there will be a, a Dropbox and that is just, it's a text submission. It's not a file submission. And you just copy and paste the GitHub link and that's it, nothing else, just the GitHub link. And then you click the pencil icon in the top right of this section, like this one right here, and you edit this readme straight from the GitHub website, okay? Edit this file to include your group info and remove these instructions. So here is what you do. I, I cannot believe how many people didn't remove the instructions last time. So you're gonna click here. That is going to open up the little wiki editor for that. You are going to delete this. You are going to edit this to say comp4300 project group name. You're going to edit that, okay? I wanna know, that's maybe like the name of your game. You are going to put in any and all of your group members here. So your names, your student IDs, your emails. And then anytime a project video is due, so the demo is due on one date, the trailer is due on another date, all you have to do to submit that is put the URL in right here, okay? So you just copy and paste the URL and then we can go to your repo and we can see that. And then all your instructions for setting up and running your project you're just gonna delete this and you're gonna put all of your instructions right here. So for example, if you used, I don't know, whatever assets or if they're in a different folder or something, you'll explain it all right there. Now, I'm not gonna edit this one because um, this is the instructions that you're going to have to use, but that's what the repo is. Now let's have a look inside these three folders. Okay, so inside the proposal folder, uh, my edits will be lost, that's okay. There's just one file, it's called readme.txt. And it says, this folder should contain a single PDF of your project proposal. Pretty easy. You make a PDF of your project proposal. You put it in this folder. You, you delete this file. So you delete the readme file and you push to your GitHub. Done. For the demo, this folder is used to submit your code as it was at the time of your demo. Okay. So back here, Right here is where you put the URL for your project demo, right? But with the project demo, in order to create that demo, you had to have code. And so this folder is where you put your code for that demo. And whenever you submit code, I want you to have the same structure that we have for our assignments, okay? So you're gonna submit your assignment code, well, the, the, the structure of the assignment code to GitHub. So for example, you'll have the source folder, the bin folder, the VS folder, if you're a Visual Studio project um, person, and you'll also have your make file, your assets, whatever, and they will go in this folder. Then the final one in here, you have the exact same thing, except this is for the final, final project submission, and it should have the same structure as the, um, the assignments. So it's basically the same thing as demo, but it's for your final project submission. Okay, and you remove the readme file and then that's it. That is the template project and that's what you're gonna use. And it just makes marking 
ever so much easier for us because it has the same template. We know where to find everyone's stuff. We're going to have bookmarks of all your GitHub. We can see you submitting, right? So if you say, oh, we've been working so hard on this and we just need an extension of one day. And then I look at the GitHub and there hasn't been a single commit. Right? So it's a nice way to track progress of, of student projects and keep them honest about what they've actually done. All right. Um, so that's the template project. You have to use this. It is mandatory. You cannot do the project without using this. Now, that being said, I don't care if you actually use GitHub in the correct way to actually collaborate on your project. Like if you use Dropbox and you want to destroy your brains by trying to use something other than GitHub for your project collaboration, by all means. But please, you have to submit by using this GitHub. And I highly recommend using it since it's a, a code um, versioning system. That's, that's really, really good. Let's look back at, the, uh, at this now. Oh, I forgot to say this. This is possibly the most important part of all of this, okay? Every single year, without fail, there are between two and four projects where the following thing happens. The deadline goes past, and nobody has submitted anything. And it's the most frustrating thing in the world, because as of right now, you have almost two months to do your project, okay? And as of the time of the proposal, you have a full month. As of, the t as of the time of the demo, you have a full week. There will be no late project submissions accepted for any reason, okay? Unless one of your group members is in dire medical condition, and I mean like physically incapable of typing, okay? There is no on the due date, our partner got sick yesterday. That is not, I don't, yes, I care. I don't want anyone to get sick, but you have a month to do this thing. I physically cannot mark the assignments if they are submitted late, okay? Now, that being said, if like the whole group got COVID together or something, you know, whatever happened, there's like the slim possibility of like a deferral but that is a very dire circumstance that is going to have to come with extensive medical documentation. Okay. Now, what also happens every single year is that two days before the project is due, two or three groups will say, we haven't seen this person in three weeks. How can we possibly finish the project? Well, that's on you because you didn't tell me when it happened, right? If you have been trying to communicate with any group member for more than, a, let's say, three days and they have not responded to you, tell me that right then, at that time. I cannot, guys, I'm being very serious here. I cannot stress to you that I cannot accept projects after this due date. I cannot physically mark them in time and you will not pass this course if this is not submitted on time. Please, you have to submit this on time. And even though I'm saying this, because I've said this every single year, it will still happen this year. So please, 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 you don't understand how, like, as we look back, if we go, let me go, okay. Uh, just to remind you how important this is, let's look at the course syllabus, all right? The course syllabus, um, we're going to zoom in. The important thing here, due to the unique marking structure of this course, you must pass the final project to pass the course. If your grade on the project is less than 50%, then your overall course grade will be equal to the mark that you received on the final project. So if you get a 20 on the final project, you get a 20 in the course. Like this whole course is about the project. Okay, the whole course is about the project. Now, that being said, it is very unlikely that if you submit a video demo, I will catch the fact that you're about to fail at the video demo, okay? Because normally the video demo, you'll have about half of the game done. If you submit a video demo, 
that has very, very little of the game done, I'll be able to catch this there and like sort of say, okay, you guys really need to pick it up for the final project. I have never had a single case in all of my years of doing this course of someone just submitting the final project, it failing, and then that was all that happened. Okay? But that being said, you have to work on this final project. It is as important as your final exam in any other course, if not more important. The whole course is building up to this project. I cannot stress how important it is that you submit it and that you submit it on time. Okay? It was in the syllabus. You got to pass this final project. Even if you have hundreds in every assignment, the whole point of this is the final project. You cannot get... So let's look back at our marking scheme. The marking scheme has 50% of your grade for assignments. I don't care if you have 100% on every assignment and you have 50 going into the project, you can't hand in a project where you did 10% of the work. You have to pass the final project. All right, now I, serious time is over, right? I, I have to say that because it's still gonna happen. I'm still gonna get someone on the due date and you're, you are watching this right now and you are laughing. Ha ha, that won't be me, Dave. Stop it. Just go to the next section, please. But it will be you. Because it's one of you. <laughs> it will happen. I hope it doesn't. But every year, it happens. So, all right. Enough of that. You know that I'm being serious about that. So, all of these things that I said now, let's go into the details of those. Now that we know sort of the overview of the project. And you can see sort of the scope of the project. So the project proposal. Your group must submit a project proposal detailing what you plan to do with your group. The project, the proposal will be reviewed to determine whether it is enough work or too much work for the scope of the course. So we'll look at it and you say, we're gonna do assignment three with different textures. No, you're not. That's, that's not a project, okay? Um, or you could say, we're gonna make a, an MMO. No, you're not. No, you're not, okay? Don't, you're not gonna do that. We're gonna make sure that it's right in the sweet spot. And we have, I have outlined in detail exactly the features that you need to make it enough work for the course, but we'll talk about that in a bit. The project proposal should be a single PDF uploaded to the proposal folder on GitHub describing the following information and be approximately two to three pages, okay? This is a game design document. It is of significant length. It's not, we're gonna make a Mega Man clone well, no, you got to describe things. So the game name, the genre, the overall feel, and the main gameplay style. Examples of gameplay scenarios involving each of the game mechanics listed below. And a list of extra features that might not have been completed in the assignments. Okay, so what are you going to do that makes your game special? Alrighty. The project proposal is next. Three weeks or sorry, the project demo is next. Three weeks after the project proposal and one week before the final due date of the project, you are required to submit a video approximately three minutes in length, which shows off the features which you have gotten to work so far. You do not have to have all of the functionality of the game working, but you must have a functioning game with its main gameplay at that point. So meaning like, Kind of the main feel of the game should really be there three weeks into the project. This milestone is in place to ensure that you keep on track for the final submission. Please show off all of the working functionality of the game with a short, short voiceover commentary on what is working and what is not working at that point. Okay, so the project demo, no, that is not supposed to be you have everything working, but it is supposed to be you should probably have about half of it done maybe two thirds of it, okay? It's, you are three quarters of the way through the time of the project. I think having half of it done is pretty fair. So that is your first deadline, but you don't have to have all of it done. This is my 10% marks to make sure that you're all on track to actually complete the course properly. And then I can look at that and I can give you feedback and say, you guys got to pick it up, right? Because that's, that's not a lot of work done so far in the first three weeks. The next section is the final required game features. So let's go through this, all of this because it's very detailed and 
details are good because you can refer back to this document instead of asking me questions. That being said, I don't mind if you ask me questions, but if, it, if it's in the document, just, just read the document. Because any question I get, I get 80 of them. I don't just get one. So it's, it's a lot. All right. The game overview. The game must be implemented using the ECS architecture in C++ using only the SFML library. If you have an insanely good reason for using a particular library, you can use it. But no, you can't go download Box2D physics engine because we are implementing the physics in this course. Um, one thing that I have seen students do that I will allow is a JSON library, a JSON reading library, okay? Because, or whatever data format reading library that you may need if you want to store your levels in JSON or something like that. That's okay. I don't expect you to read in JSON, but you probably also don't need JSON. So unless you have a really good reason for a specific library and any library you use can only be something like a base functionality reading a JSON file. You cannot use any library that does any graphics, any physics, any gameplay mechanics, any input parsing. We're writing this engine from scratch, okay? You may use any course code already written as the basis for your game as long as it comes from one of your group members. Okay, it cannot come from anyone else. Um, game types. You can make a 2D platformer. Now, if you make a 2D platformer, it has to be significantly different from Assignment 3. You can't just take... I have had people literally submit Assignment 3. I have one group submit basically Assignment 3 with maybe an hour of work on top of it for the project. That didn't go very well for them, okay? It has to be very different from Assignment 3 if it's a 2D platformer. It has to have way different mechanics, way different level design, way different physics, okay? It has to be very different from Assignment 3. You could have a top-down shooter, an RPG, an action-adventure game. So let me tell you right now that an excellent excellent idea for a game is something like a top-down action RPG game that implements features like Diablo or Path of Exile. That is an excellent, excellent picture assignment two, okay, where you're shooting things that spawn on the map, except you have like damage types and different enemies and like generating dungeons that you walk through and stuff. Like that is an excellent excellent idea for a game. You don't have to do that, but it's an excellent idea that's different enough from the, um, from the assignments. But if you do want to make your own Legend of Zelda, right, you can. It just has to be way different from assignment four. All right. Your, your game must come with at least three pre-built levels and also have a final boss battle. Okay. And you have to progress through those three levels, right? So you have to beat level one, which unlocks level two, which unlocks level three, which unlocks the boss battle. And the boss has to be unique. It has to have like a health bar. It has, you know, something has to happen that makes that boss special. All right. It must have a custom menu that allows the player to either like a main menu, right? Where you say, play the game, edit the levels or select the options, for example. It must contain some sort of in-game menu as well. So how you select items, you go through your inventory, your game options, etc. So it has to have a main menu. It has to have an in-game menu. It must contain a level editor that allows for the loading, editing, and saving of game levels. Okay, I have a section on that, but this is probably going to be the most amount of single work for a single feature is the level editor. You are actually creating a level editor for your game where you can load and save levels via that level editor. So it must contain a game over screen indicating when the game has been finished. And please don't make the game insanely difficult. I want to be able to play and beat your game. Some people make these like bullet hell levels or like these Kaizo Mario games. Guys, I'm, give me a break here. I, I got to be able to finish your game. Don't make it super simple, 
But if you are finding it difficult to beat, please tone it down a little bit, <laughs> right? All right. All levels, player and game configuration options must be defined in external text files. So all of your game options like volume, right? Um, your levels, the player settings, all defined in external text files, just like we've been doing so far. And all the assets should be gathered by or created by the group project members. So I'll talk a little bit about more about that, but you are going to have different assets than the ones we have in our project, in our uh, assignments. The different game scenes. So you've seen so far that we've had two scenes in our game. Here are the scenes that you have to have for your project. So a main menu scene that implements the main menu functionality, and we'll talk about that in a bit. It must contain some sort of overworld map that allows for level selection or game, pro um, game progression. So if you've ever seen like Super Mario World, Mario 3, um, Mario Odyssey, something like that, there is some sort of scene in which you're walking around on an overworld map and you select a level to be played. That is what you have to do for this game. Um, it must contain a main gameplay scene that implements the game physics of the main gameplay mode. So that's what you've been doing in your project. So you're definitely gonna have that. Must contain some sort of inventory or in-game, um, That's that word is not supposed to be there, in-game scene that is used for a relevant function. So that sort of inventory, um, like if you have items that you have, you wanna select through, etc. And it must contain a level editor scene that implements the level editor functionality. So you have to have, there are a bunch of scenes in this thing. And it must contain a game over scene with some sort of either animations or credits that, um, that appear there that say, hey, this game was created by whoever, congratulations, you beat the game, or you suck, you died, that sort of thing. Here is the main section. This, this is the required gameplay and mechanics section. Your game must contain all of the following mechanics. Describe how they will be used in the proposal. So there's a lot of mechanics here, but anything that I've put in green has already been done in your assignments. So yes, this is like a whole page of mechanics. I know it's a lot of stuff, but you've done probably half of this already in your assignments, okay? So anything in green, you already have done. Anything in black is something that you may not have done yet, okay? So just keep in mind, for your assignments, if you implement some of these things, moving tiles, status effects, lighting effects, whatever, if you put these into your assignments early, it's doubly good for you. Why? Because A, you've already done some of the work of your project, and B, you can get bonus marks on your assignments for doing things that are for the project. So just think about that. If you have a lot of time right now in your assignments, but you may not have a lot of time toward finals to work on your project, you can implement these things as bonuses right now in your assignments for bonus marks and then have the doubly good effect of already being finished those parts of the project. Okay, so just keep that in mind as you do your assignments as well. Anything you hand in for your assignments, you can also do, you can also hand in as part of your um, project. So the things we have to have, collisions, right? You have collisions already. Your game must include rectangular bounding box collisions between some entities. That doesn't mean that you can only have rectangular collisions, but it must at least contain rectangular collisions. Your game must include multiple weapons that are usable by the player and swappable during gameplay. For example, Mega Man or Link swapping weapons during gameplay. So you must have at least three different weapons in your game. And I mean different weapons, not one gun that like, you can't have a nine millimeter, a 44 Magnum and a revolver. Okay, you can't have three single bullet guns. That is one weapon. You must have like, okay, maybe you have a nine millimeter gun, you have a flamethrower and you have an ax, okay? So your multiple weapons 
must have different mechanics. Very plainly put, your multiple weapons must have different mechanics. And you have to be able to swap between them during gameplay. NPCs. There must be non-player characters in the game that act as either enemies or allies for certain gameplay elements. Some of these NPCs must contain basic AI, such as pathfinding, shooting, patrolling, or battling with the player. We're going to be doing that in Assignment 4, so that's not going to be too bad. Now, your final boss battle must have a significantly more advanced system than your typical NPCs in the game. Moving tiles. Your game must include some part of the level which moves, such as a platform or an elevator. I want you to do that. Hit points and damage. Players and enemies in the game should have hit points and take damage and then eventually die. We're going to do that in assignment four, so you'll know how to do that. Your game must contain at least three separate status effects which the player can obtain in some way. So for example, you would maybe activate an ability to have a status effect. Maybe it's a collision or an item. Something activates a status effect which alters the gameplay for a short amount of time. For example, Maybe you have a speed potion that allows the player to run faster. Temporary invulnerability, like a Super Mario Star. Or a quad damage, like from Quake. Okay? So you can have those exact three things, if you want. It just has to be in your game and activatable or triggerable somehow. And we will actually be doing a little bit of a status effect for assignment 4, so maybe this should be green as well. Objects and inventory. The player should have an inventory items which can be picked up during play and used somehow. So for example, you might have a health pack or a sprint potion, and when you pick it up, your in-game menu must show the available items to the player somehow. So maybe you'll have down in the bottom right, you'll show your three potion slots, and as you pick up a potion, maybe it shows it in that slot, and then you can hit the three button to use your third potion or something like that, okay? Ray casting. Visibility and ray casting calculations should be used in some form in the game. For example, the enemy might not react until they see, see the player. Maybe you have a turret or something like that. That is going to be done in assignment four, so we'll, we'll have that done already, or at least the mechanics of that. Lighting effects. Your game must contain some sort of lighting effect, similar to the one demonstrated in class via the sight and light demo. For example, carrying a torch or flashlight around a level or placing sources within a level. I had one group, one year, who thought that this said a lightning effect, like thunder and lightning. <laughs> it's kind of funny because they thought it said lightning effect, they implemented lightning in the game, and the lightning just happened to also have a lighting effect associated with it. So that was really funny, but they got away with it because they also accidentally did the thing that I wanted them to do. Um, so you can have lightning if you want, right? It's super dark, there's a lightning crash, and then, you know, certain parts of the level are illuminated or whatever. Gravity or acceleration. There must be some sort of gravity or attractor in the game that applies acceleration to the player. So, for example, if you're making a 2D platformer, um, then gravity is obvious, right? It's pulling you downward. However, if you're doing something like Diablo, like a top-down shooter, how are you going to have gravity in that type of game, right? So this means that there could be some sort of attractor as well. So maybe, for example, you have a weapon that fires a gravity well that sucks enemies into it and does AoE damage or something like that, okay? So you have to have this in your game in some way, shape, or form. Camera and worldview. Your game must use at least two different camera views in some sort of interesting way. And I'll leave that up to you. And that doesn't mean that you have one view that's just zoomed out and one view that's zoomed in. Okay, for example, one of the ways that you can do this, and is the way that most people usually do, is you could have a mini-map, right? Via, like, you create a second view, you put it in its own viewport, and that mini-map is, is a second view, right? All right. Pathfinding or steering. Some entities in the game must exhibit non-trivial pathfinding and smooth steering behavior. We haven't, we haven't covered this yet, but steering essentially is like how you smooth behavior of NPCs and stuff, 
And so, for example, you could have a homing missile that homes in on a target using a steering behavior. That's a fine implementation. Um, or you could implement the A star pathfinding algorithm if you want to, right? Like just whatever satisfies this, this line right here. Game progression. Your overworld map should somehow lock or unlock game progression based on levels completed. So if you don't have level one done, you can't go to level two. If you don't have level two done, you can't go to level three. Save and load game. You must have the ability to save and load your progress to a file somehow. So if I close your game and open it back up, my progress has been saved. Uh, shaders. Some entities in the game must have shaders that alter their appearance in some meaningful way. And we'll have a whole lecture on shaders. But essentially, what we are going to be using shaders for, shaders can be used to do a lot of things, um, is going to be like a filter that you put over an enemy. So for example, if you want, like if an enemy has some sort of status effect and it glows green, you're going to do that using shaders. And you're going to have at least three shaders in your game that do something. Parallax. You must incorporate par parallax via multiple background layers in some way, shape, or form in your game. Okay, Parallax must be there somehow. User interface or HUD. Your game must have a user interface or heads-up display which displays information such as player health, ammo, game progression, status effect, NPC life bars, etc. That has to be there. Some of this will be done in assignment 4, some of it won't. Sounds. Your game must have music that plays in the background, as well as unique sounds associated with attacking, taking or dealing damage, killing enemies, picking up items, finishing levels, etc. So you're going to have sounds in the game. We'll talk all about sounds for assignment 4. And you must also have options. So on the, on the main menu, you're going to have an options selector. And your game must have an options menu, which allows you to change the following settings. Music value, uh, music value, music volume, sound effects volumes. These must be separate options, okay? So I should be able to turn off the music and turn up the sound effects, for example. Game difficulty. This is another feature that's kind of hidden in this line of code. So you must have um, three difficulties for your game, normal, easy, hard. And for example, one thing you can do is that for normal, that's the base version of the game, easy, your monsters take significantly um, less damage to kill, or for hard, they take double the damage to kill. Um, oh, sorry. I, I explained that wrong. So you have a normal mode, you have an easy mode. In easy mode, you deal twice the damage and you take half the damage. And in hard mode, you deal half the damage and take twice the damage. So you can modify these a bit if you want, if you have better ideas for hard or easy mode. Maybe in hard mode, more enemies spawn or something like that but you must have a difficulty setting which actually alters your gameplay. You can use a global difficulty namespace to store variables related to these settings, or you can store things however you want to implement that, that difficulty thing. And you have to have in your menu somehow a way of rebinding the main gameplay scene keys. So for example, maybe by default, sorry, I got cat hair in my eye. Um, maybe by default you use W, A, S, and D to move around in your game, or you use the arrow keys. In your menu, you have to be able to rebind those keys to something else. So there's somewhere that says, hey, moving left is the A key. And then if you hit like enter and hit G or something like that, now G is the move left key, for example. Extras. 10% of the mark is reserved for the extra or new mechanics not specifically listed here. So if you do something extra, uh, like, in, like really cool special effects, complicated weapons, a really polished UI, a cool animated menu or something like that, all of that can go towards 10% of your bonus mark. All right. Uh, probably, like I said, the biggest single feature that you have to worry about is the level editor. And I, I highly recommend just saying, hey, you in the group, you're the level editor person. <laughs> and that person should be a good programmer because this is a, a, lot, of, a lot of features. Um, so your game must contain a level editor 
similar to the one found in the Mega Man Maker or Super Mario Maker game. If you are not familiar with these games, go look on YouTube, but I will have a lecture um, devoted to game tools in which I will talk more about level editors, okay? So I'll talk more about that later in the course. All of your main gameplay levels must be able to be made from within the editor. So all of your actual levels in the game have to be made from your level editor. You cannot hand code any levels. Your overworld map, however, can be hand coded if you want, okay? Uh, this level editor should operate on a grid similar to the ones found in assignment three and four. So essentially you're going to have some sort of user interface where you can select a tile, you can place a tile on the grid, and then you have a button that can save the level or load a level. Oh, sorry, I gotta mute my phone here. All right. Uh, you should be able to select and place any texture or animation that is defined uh, in the assets file. The level editor should have a menu which allows you to select any existing level to edit. I have an example, I have some example code from other things on my GitHub. You can go have a look at that. Any parameters, this might be the, the hardest part of the level editor. Any parameters specific to the entities must be editable via the level editor. So for example, whether NPCs block vision, move in, movement, or neither. That's something we're going to be doing for assignment four. Whether uh, the hit points or the damage that an NPC deals, you have to uh, be able to edit that. And the patrol points of an NPC. So for example, in your level editor, you're going to drag over an NPC. You're going to be able to select one of the AI behaviors that you have. So like patrolling, for example. And then you're going to click on your map where the patrol points are. And so all of those parameters have to be editable via the level editor. How you accomplish that is completely up to you. I'll talk about a little bit about user interfaces later, but that is completely up to you. One um, way to build a level, what is this supposed to say? One may, one way may to, <laughs> so, one way to build to do this is to build a menu that pops up in your game somehow, or you could select a parameter via a key press and then edit it up or down via the mouse wheel. I don't care how you do it as long as you explain how to do it in the report. Or and the report, sorry, the, the video presentation. Game assets. Your game cannot reuse any of the assets that I have given to you in the course. Excuse me. Um, besides maybe Mega Man or Link, if you're if you're making a, a Mega Man clone that implements all of Mega Man 2 or something like that, you can do that. Uh, you can use the Mega Man sprite. You do not need to create original game assets from scratch, but you do need to obtain them from somewhere. Let me tell you the most important advice you can have on this project. Do not fall into the trap of game assets. This is such a minute part of the marks for the assignment, okay? I don't really care how good your game looks. Now, yes, it does matter a little bit, and if your game doesn't have any assets, it's going to lose a bunch of marks. But, like, please devote your time and energy into all of this and not this. This should be one of the last things that you care about. Okay, I have seen people like two of the four people spend a whole project working on game assets. You do not need to create original game assets from scratch. You just need to go out and find some texture pack somewhere that your game looks kind of interesting. I had one guy who made all the assets in Microsoft Paint and they were so scuffed, but it was so funny and so fun to play. Like one person used my face as one of, as the final boss, like so many different things. I care about the programming in this course. I don't care about the assets. If you go above and beyond in the assets, it's fine. Maybe you get some bonus marks for that. But some people, they have like one person's like, no, I'm just working on the assets. Tell that person to go find another group because the game assets should take you all of about two hours. Okay. To go find and, and jam into your game. So please um, 
don't don't worry too much about game assets. It's so so trivial in comparison to the to the game mechanics and the programming part. So that's it. That's what your game is. That's it, right? Looks really easy. So like I said, if you're interested in any of this stuff, you can put it into your assignments in advance to get bonus marks and then you'll also be finished it for your project. So I know doing extra work is like everyone's allergic to that, but you got to do it eventually. So you may as well get some bonus marks for it too. Okay. YouTube game trailer. 5% of the project mark is for making a YouTube video trailer for your game. Two to three minutes long. Even though 5% of your mark, it's only 5% of your mark, you must produce a YouTube trailer. Okay? You must produce it. It is a required part. So it's marked out of 5%, but it must be present. And the reason for this is because you will thank me later for having a YouTube trailer. Now, what do I mean for this? Um, so let me, let me finish reading this, then I'll go on a little bit of a rant. Um, sample trailers from previous course offerings can be seen on my teaching website. Trailers will be listed on the course website for future classes to see, and you can also add them to your portfolio or resume. That is why I am doing this, okay? So you can have a video that shows off what you have done and add it to your resume. So if you go to my teaching website and you scroll down, you can see student trailers. There is a YouTube playlist right here. And what I have is, and, and people go crazy with the trailers. It's really fun to see what people do with their trailers, okay? So, like, people, you know, fake reviews, um, they put in music or voiceover, like, here's the trailer for this game, um, here's a trailer for this game. Um, these, <laughs> these guys, for their project trailer, like, you know, they did a bunch of acting and stuff, like, it's really fun to, to, to do this game trailer. It's not a ton of work. And then you end up adding this to your resume and it it works out really well, okay? And you can also see sort of the, the level of, of other projects that have been done for the course. So by all means, go have a look at those trailers and it's a required part of the course. I really want that. Also a required part of the course, like again, this is worth 20%, but you can't not submit it. If you do not submit a project video report, you do not get grades for your project. One group tried to say, oh yeah, it's only worth 20%, so we just didn't do it. That's not how it works. I am saying it now, so you can't do something like that later. This is how I'm going to tell that you've done your work, is with this project report video, okay? Um, this project report video presentation should be between 10 and 15 minutes. Most people take the full 15 minutes containing the following information. An overview of the game giving details on all of the described things in the game overview section. So what you do in your video is you just have a little script where you go down and you say, here's where the collisions are. Here's the different bullets and weapons. Here's the NPCs. Here's the moving tiles. Here's the hit points and damage. Like, now you could just say, here's the NPCs, they have a gun, it, de it deals damage to me. So, you know, you could describe three or four things in one line, but just go through and make sure you describe every single feature that made it into your game and every single feature that did not make it into your game. Describe to me all of the extras that you did and tell me why you should get the 10% bonus marks. Demonstrate all of the game mechanics with at least one full level playthrough. Ideally, I also get to see your final boss battle and you talk about the game mechanics of the final boss battle. Also, demo the level editor. So show me how powerful your level editor is and make or edit a level in the video. Do not take 10 minutes to make a level. Take one minute to show me the level editor, maybe two minutes to show me the level editor and all of its features. Um, I want you to describe how you control the game. Is it keyboard? Is it mouse? Is it both? Instructions on how to play, where, what the objectives are for the game. Okay, you're going to save uh, the prince from the castle, right? Um, that's, that's what you're doing. Now show me what that entails. Notes on anything that you tried to implement that did not end up working. If you don't include something, you get a zero for it, unless you explain to me 
how you tried it, and then maybe you get bonus marks for it. And this video must contain audio commentary and explanation. So you have to be speaking, it's a presentation, and ideally, everybody in the group speaks during the project, during, during the presentation, okay? So you split up the time equally, and what I recommend is that everyone talks about the thing that they worked on, okay? And then that gets uploaded to YouTube. If you're absolutely stuck for a game idea, go play some NES or Super NES games and get an idea for that. For example, if you want to create, recreate the entire game mechanics of Super Mario 3 or Mega Man 2, that could work, right? That's a, that's a lot of work. Just be sure to implement all of the required project features, which may not be present in those games. So you can't just implement Mega Man because Mega Man may not have some sort of smooth steering, right? You've got to have, you've got to have steering behaviors as well. And that is the description of the project. So, uh, is there anything else I want to talk about? Oh yeah. So let me describe one thing that will come up. So you're going to have group member one, two, three, four. You're going to have some number of group members up to four of those, right? What I do not recommend is the following. This person works on the game engine. This person works on the menus. This person works on the gameplay. This person works on the assets. This is what looks like an ideal breakdown of what should be happening in the game, okay? Or what, what features you need. But what happens in a depressing amount of cases is this person disappears or drops the course. Now what are you going to do? It happens. It can happen. Probably won't happen, but it can happen. What I recommend is that you create a list of all the things in the game that are going to be done. Level editor, menus, gameplay, uh, assets, you have uh, shaders, you have um, gravity, you have level design, something like that, right? You have overworld map, you have end credits. And what you do is you assign two people for each of these things. So person one and two are working on the game editor. Two and three are working on the menus. Two and four are working on the gameplay. Three and one are working on the assets. That way, no single person can disappear and destroy your game. Okay? I highly recommend that every part of your engine is owned by two people. Because you will learn very quickly that if a single person is, is the only person in charge of that, then if that person disappears... And so, because I have said this, because I have explained this division of work, please, if someone disappears from your group, and if that person was supposed to do the level editor, and you only had one person working on the level editor, and you come to me one day before the due date, and say, this person disappeared, and they were supposed to do the level editor. I will say, okay, who else was supposed to do the level editor? You can't just have one person own a particular feature, right? So make sure if someone... Like working in groups, I know it comes with its challenges. I know that better than most people. Because not only have I worked in groups my whole life, but I have also supervised groups and observed student groups. Making this document of who owns what is a very good idea because then the expectations and the division of work is done up front. Not only that, but you may have people in the group who have specialties. I'm really good at graphics programming. I'm really good at making assets. I'm really good at gameplay programming. Oh, I really want to do the level editor. So people get to work on the things that they want to work on without exclusive ownership. Also, if there's something at fault, like if something is slacking, you can say, okay, maybe we need another person on that 
Don't go yell at the person if they're not as far along as you, but you know who to help, you know what part needs a little bit of work. If a specific person disappears from your group or stops responding or you feel is not pulling their weight, tell me about it. If you are one week into the project and three people have been busting their butt and another person hasn't done anything, tell me about it. I'm not going to get mad at that person. I'm not going to think the other three who have been doing work are better people. This is not snitching or anything like that it is you know in your in your actual programming life actually after you finish this course you are going to have some sort of supervisor or team lead whose job it is to keep things on track right and if there's a problem you can't wait until the customer is supposed to receive the product i'm both the customer and the team lead for this course okay if you have problems come to me I'm here to mediate those problems, right? And if there's someone not working for whatever reason, if it's medical, if they just spaced out, if they're having an anxiety attack, whatever, you guys don't have to deal with that. Come to me. I'll talk to that person. I'll say, hey, I know you're going through some stuff. Your group members have expressed some concern. Um, are you okay? What's going on? Do you need any help? That's what I'm for, okay? I am not here to say, haha, that person did nothing, they get a zero. That is not what you're doing by coming to me for help, okay? What you're doing is you are helping to fix the problem before it becomes unsolvable, right? I have had several groups in the past, you know, have these like Beatles, you know, the Beatles split up like, you know, maybe John and... John and Paul are not getting along or whatever, or two people want to work on the same thing and they are like, they're butting heads and they just want, oh, I, I want a different group. We talked, we talk. And then in the end, I think I've only had one case where something really bad happened personally between two people um, and then they couldn't work together. But we've always been able to talk it out. We have always found a solution. And please, please come to me when problems happen not when the effects of the problems happen, all right? So, if you have two people in your group, be damn sure that that other person is not going to abandon you, all right? Also, please submit proposals early and also use Discord and use the looking for group sheet to find groups for the project. I, I, I cannot state this enough that I understand people's problems with group work. I am not clueless to that. I know that it's frustrating waiting for a feature for somebody. I know that it's frustrating when someone tries to claim credit for something that they didn't do. I completely understand every single aspect of the frustrations of group work. But what you don't understand is that there are also benefits to group work. Group work is what you are going to be doing for the rest of your life, right? And when people say, oh, school doesn't prepare you for the real world, it didn't teach me React. It didn't teach me SQL. Oh my God, I can't stand stuff like that. The, the hardest part about any actual job is dealing with people, right? And this is what I'm trying to help you prepare for as well, right? I, I cannot have, if you're going to work by yourself for this project, good luck. I think two people have ever passed the final project alone and they were doing like two courses that term. Don't do the final project alone. I am not going to be saying, hey, you can you can do the final project alone, but I'm going to give you a bunch of, like, you don't have to do half the features. No, no, no. The project is the project, and however many people you take to do the project is on you. So I, I understand your frustrations, and I know I'm kind of ranting and going on about this, but it's very important that I, I do understand that, and you can come to me and talk about that. If you absolutely can't find a group, I will try and help you find a group. But please, please try for a week or two 
before you come to me for help. Like you should really try before you come to me. Don't message me today and say, I need a group. Okay. I've had people do that and it's, and it's really annoying. So please, I know that there are frustrations. I think that one of the most common frustrations that I've seen in group work is the following. It's when one person on the team may be a above average talented programmer where they have done a lot of work on their own. Maybe they contribute to open source, maybe do programming on their own time. For whatever reason, that person happens to be more skilled than someone else on the team. Okay. And so there's someone else on the team who's maybe not doing as much work because they're not as strong a programmer. They don't have a, as big a work ethic. I understand that. I've gone through that in my career multiple times. However, if you are a weaker programmer, that's okay. You can take the time that you need to implement your features. You can get help. Don't be afraid to ask for a group member. One little life hack that you should know about is that the quickest way to gain the respect of any person in any circumstance in life is to ask for their advice. You can boss around people all you want. You can peacock around and act like you know everything. People generally dislike when people do that, okay? But if you are in a new situation and you, you genuinely ask for someone else's advice with something or someone else's um, take on something or their opinion on something or ask for a little bit of help, that person now identifies you as someone who can admit when they need a little bit of advice. And also they're a bit flattered that you went to them for that advice. Like, it's such a great thing to just... Now, I mean, if you take that to the extreme and every third line of code you're asking them for advice, that's a little bit, you know, that's a little bit much. They, they might get annoyed at that. But don't be afraid to work as a team. I, I can't tell you how many people have said, you know, I, I was really frustrated at first, but in the end we produce a great product and I'm glad that I did that thing. I'm glad I had that experience of, of doing group work. And if you're one of those, so that's what I recommend for someone who may feel like they're not one of the stronger programmers on the team. But if you are, and even if you're some absolute genius programmer, okay, and you think that everyone else is beneath you, like, God, I've had snobs like that before. Yeah, there are some people who are just more practiced at programming than others. But what I will tell you is the following. You can become a much better programmer by helping people who are not as strong as you at programming. You may ask how. Well, for example, since I started teaching, by definition, if I'm teaching, pretty much what I'm dealing with on a daily basis with assignments and helping people is people who don't know as much as me. Just for the simple fact that I'm older, I'm more experienced, and I'm teaching you this content, right? And you might think it's just annoying for me to have to teach sometimes or to have to deal with people who maybe don't know the answer to something. It's not at all. Through helping someone else learn a topic, you become much better at that thing. If you, there, there's like two levels of understanding of something. The first level of under, or maybe three levels. I'm, I'm winging all of this, by the way, so give me a break if it's not correct. But there's three levels of understanding of something. The first level is when you have been told it, right? Someone has told you about a thing. The second level is when you have implemented it. So you've taken that knowledge that someone told you and you've built something. And the third level is when you have taught it to somebody. And let me tell you that the difference between two and three, the difference between having implemented something and having taught something is probably bigger than the difference between having implemented it and only having been told it. Like I cannot express to you how much more familiar 
intimately familiar I had to become with this, with this material in this course before I was able to teach it. Like I had implemented this stuff a dozen times. Algorithms, um, AI, game programming, graphics stuff. I have been implementing this stuff for like 20 years. But it's only in the last couple of years since I have had to teach it and explain it and help people with it that I really have really understood it. And since I've been like writing documentation for stuff, man, you might think writing documentation is just this bullshit annoying thing that you have to do as part of your job. It's insane how much better a programmer and an architect of software you become once you start writing documentation. And here's the reason why. You've implemented something, it works. Now you have to either explain how it works to someone or write documentation or both. And so through the writing of the documentation, you're like, okay, in order to set this up, you have to do step one and then you do step two. And maybe if there's an error, you do step three and then, oh, wait a minute. Um, that's really convoluted and stupid. I could combine those two steps. So, okay, now I've combined those two steps into a simpler step or how you use this API. Well, first you have to create this object and that gets passed into this class and that there's an error mess. Okay. No, there's gotta be an easier way to do this, right? And so then you go back and you redesign things. Like, so I've written a lot of, of projects on GitHub. You can go on GitHub and I've got probably a dozen projects that people use on a regular basis. And it's not until I start writing the documentation for those things that the architecture actually starts to come together. Because once you have to explain your nonsense architecture to someone, you realize I've really got to buckle down and actually make this like better, right? So the whole rant here is just saying that even if you are feel that you are a stronger programmer, which can be annoying because you feel like you're doing more work, you can become an even better programmer by helping other people, by explaining the architecture to them, by maybe helping them with a little bit of the code or by trying to delegate work or explain things or <laughs> they will make you better for just having interacted with them. And I know that you're like shaking your head or rolling your eyes or whatever. And you're saying, oh, this is just Dave's way of like getting us to work in groups without complaining. Well, there's a little bit of that. It's maybe 20% that of me trying to reassure you, but it is genuinely my opinion that working in groups makes you a better programmer. And the last reason is because you have to read each other's code. And I will tell you from experience, you may not yet in your computer science career have had the unfortunate <laughs> part of, of programming, which is reading other people's code. It is a hundred times easier to write code than to read code. You might not think that, but just wait, just you wait and you'll be three years, maybe three days into your first job when you get out of computer science and you'll say, oh my God, was Dave ever right? It is a hundred times harder to read and understand someone else's code than it is to write your own code. And the reason for that isn't necessarily because their code is bad. Sometimes it, that is the reason. But it's because when you write code, you have the entire mental model of your whole architecture in your head and you're just going through your head and you're implementing it. But when you are reading code, you do not have their entire mental model in your head. So you have to read line by line and start piecing together their mental model of what they wanted their code to do right? You have to look at the header files to get the structure. You have to look at the code. You're like, why did they do that? Why did they do that? And then eventually, oh, it clicked. I've never seen anyone do it, do it that way before. That's really interesting. So yes, group work can be annoying, but I promise you that in the long term of, and I mean long term, like your life, career, that sort of thing, I promise you that the experiences you have with this project and this group work will be beneficial to you. If nothing other than the fact that you have to somehow share code, possibly via GitHub, that's going to be a skill that you will take with you forever if you haven't used GitHub before. So that's my rant on working with groups. 
I completely understand your frustrations. If there are any problems, come to me early with those problems. Okay. I think that's all I have to say about the project. Please start forming your projects early. Use the looking for group sheet. Use the Discord. Later on, if you're absolutely stuck, use me. Tell me about any problems you're having. Ask me, you know, do you think this is a good idea? Um, don't put any networking in your game. Absolutely no networking. It will consume your soul. Okay? And don't put any multi-threading. No multi-threading, no networking. It will consume your soul and you will not complete the project. I promise you that is the case. All right. So that is the project. Um, that's what you have to do. You know all the due dates. A link to the PDF project spec is right here. It's also right here. It's hosted on D2L. Um, so what we're going to do for the rest of the course is explain all of those things that you have to do for your project. Okay, so we will be implementing things as we go. And even though this seems like a lot to do, and it is a lot to do, you're going to be doing the majority of it in your assignments anyway. Okay, so just keep that in mind. All right, thank you so much for tuning in. I know it took me an hour and 15 minutes to explain the project. So I'm, oh my God, how long is it going to take to do the project? Well, as of right now, you've got two months to do the project. As of the proposal submission, you have one month to do the project. So there's plenty of time as long as you don't wait till the last minute. Thank you so much for watching. I'm really, truly excited to see what your projects are all about. And I can't wait to see your proposals and give that feedback. So give it as soon as possible and I'll give my feedback as soon as possible. See you later.